I have seven o'clock on my phone. So uh, I think we'll call the select board meeting for November 16th, 2020 to order. Uh, first thing to do is to approve the agenda. Any changes or someone would like to make a motion? I would like to make a brief change to the agenda. It's a small item uh, with the most recent uh, advent of the Waterbury Reader. Do we want to again reconsider what our paper of record is? And if we could maybe have a brief discussion of that. Is the, is the reader um, part of the Times Argus and is that currently our paper of record? It's the, from what I understand, it's a joint uh, project between the Waterbury Roundabout and the Times Argus. Okay, we'll throw that uh, as item B in manager's items. Sure. Um, any other changes? Can I get a motion to approve the agenda with the change? I'll move sure. to approve the agenda um, as presented with the additional change. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Next, consent agenda items, minutes of November 2nd meeting. Um, any discussion or would someone like to make a motion to approve the consent agenda items? I make a motion to approve the Second. Is there a second? Any further discussion? Who seconded All that? that? Uh, Mike. Mike. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Public, we definitely have some members here. I don't know if anyone would like to speak during this time. Tom and Meg, uh, you're, I'm gonna start with Tom and Meg. Your uh, microphone is muted. Tom, we can't hear you. How about now? There yeah, we go. We can hear you now, go ahead. Okay, now's my time. Okay, start the clock. Um, I wanna talk about sharing uh, community resources. Uh, the center chains Frisbee course in Hope Davy is the most used in the state, according to the Waterbury record, thanks to town officials and the rec department, the outdoor activity resources in town have exploded in use in the year of COVID-19. We're all faced with the challenge of finding safe space to ride out the pandemic. Um, I'd like to discuss sharing resources in particular, the multi-use area, which contains a disc golf course, nature trails for walking and hiking, horseback riding, cross-country skiing and snowshoeing, as stated on town signage uh, by the footbridge. We're all very fortunate to have so many options within a short distance of our homes. Uh, I have a couple of particular items. One is oversight of the disc golf course. Who oversees the day-to-day -day operations of the disc golf course? Is there a formal agreement between the town and any group or individuals? Is there an agreement with the town regarding tree cutting, brush hogging, mowing, and weed whacking on park land? What is the agreement on expansion and placement of new structures, including but not limited to walkways, tee boxes, landscape tiered or stared areas, now, I'd like to know what the liability uh, coverage is for people doing these activities. And the last point on that is what's the revenue to the town from uh, course rental tournaments and leagues. The second uh, question is um, what are the designated hours of operation for the multi use area and uh, Hope Davy in general. The third question is about community access and I'd like to know how Will multi-recreational use be promoted and protected for all town residents? And uh, just a suggestion is that maybe a community board or platform would help integrate the diverse parties and interests that make Waterbury great. And that's, uh, that's my statement. Select board. So um, Tom has, has 
put a lot on everyone's plate there, including mine right now. Um, last week, uh, I can't remember which day it was, Wednesday, Thursday, I received a, a call from a citizen uh, who had had a bad experience on the disc golf course. Uh, she was there simply trying to walk and some of the people playing on the course, um, uh, at least according to what she told me, basically tried to tell her that she didn't belong there and, and were you know, pretty intimidating in their behavior. Uh, I immediately called uh, Nick Nato, the rec director, and Nick is on the call here. I can see his name anyway. Uh, Nick reached out to the woman who called me, spoke with her, and, um, you know, clearly uh, both Nick and I told her that uh, there was no reason why she could not uh, walk on the, on the course. As Tom indicated, there are places, uh, there are walking trails there. It is a multi-use area. Um, and, uh, you know, we encouraged her to, you know, make sure that she was walking, you know, not just across the course while people were playing. You can't, you can't do that on a golf course or this golf course. So Tom has thrown out a lot of questions. Uh, I don't have answers to any of those questions tonight because I heard them right now when you did. Uh, Nick is here. Uh, I'd like Nick, if you can, just to give the, the board and the public a little bit of an idea about what we're doing. Certainly, if people are cutting trees and, uh, you know, uh, altering the grounds uh, on their own. Uh, that's not that's not something that we condone. But Nick, why don't you just at least uh, give the board a little bit of insight as to how how much the facility is used and what we try to do to manage it with one rec staff? Yeah. Um, so there wasn't. Uh, first off, when when I came in a couple years ago, there wasn't an existing MOU. Um, and it was kind of just, this is the froth course, uh, you know, this golf course, uh, this is the, the group that maintains it <clears throat> in conjunction with some town, um, support as far as brush hogging or in some areas, but, um, back up a little bit in the spring, there was, uh, some issues that were brought up about the cutting of the trees without town permission. So Steve lost speech, the town planner and I took a, tour out there and made it very clear with the group and and <clears throat> I think since then there shouldn't have been any any more clearing of trees or anything like that um the game plan going forward <clears throat> was to create some signage uh that I was going to do with my general maintenance budget to just let the public know that there is walking trails there are um there are uh there's no walking trails, but in order to, to walk safely without interrupting folks who are using the golf course for golf, uh, for disc golf, um, you know, just, just for both parties to know that it's a shared facility. Uh, I, I did, I like to throw this, this analogy out there just because I understand maybe 20 years ago, it was uh, facility, it was, you know, available for, for recreational walking, um, but it's a very established this golf course that, as Tom pointed out, is one of the most popular in the state. Uh, it, it's, it's like if uh, uh, someone walked in the outfield during a game at Dak Row, um, you can walk on the outskirts of the, of the field, but if you walk through it, you're most likely going to upset people who are using that asset for what, it's, well, for what it is now. Um, that's not to say you can't go walking on it, but it's just to point out that that there is a correct way to do it. And hopefully the signage that we are designing this winter will help correct that. It'll also correct, hopefully, the disc golf users' uh, perception that the community isn't allowed out there to walk. Um, again, a lot of these issues, I'm just, these questions I'm just hearing tonight too, so I would need to do some research. Uh, I reached out last week and, um, uh, Got got a little bit of background information on this incident that happened. Uh, I'm not I'm not uh, supporting the the reaction from the disc golf users. Unfortunately, we don't have any names, but um, it is a shared use facility. We do collect fees for um, some golf tournaments that happen there. It's not significant. It's very 
uh, very inexpensive, between $50 and $75, and it's usually for, um, I think, two schools rented out to do their freshman orientation and, and to do some sort of, you know, disc golf event. And then probably a handful uh, disc golf events throughout the year. Um, besides that, we don't take any fees in. Um, uh, th I think there probably should be an MOU established and Bill and I will work on and Steve will probably work on that. It's, uh, it's a, a goal this winter, um, but it's not something that we can just turn around and do. We have to involve all the parties. Well, uh, Nick, just uh, to interrupt, uh, an MOU presumes uh, two parties and I'm not sure uh, back when the course was first established, there was a group of people who were from the local area and, and they played a lot and we kind of entered into an agreement with that group. But uh, certainly not everyone that um, uses the disc golf course is part of any group. You can just show up there and play, right? I mean, you don't, so um, we can look into the possibility of an MOU, but as I said, an MOU presumes another group and I'm not sure there is a you know, a group of people that can be identified as the Waterbury discourse users or whatever. So that's something we'll look into. If it's possible, we can do that. But uh, I think the main goal is to help educate the people that are using it for golf that it's not exclusively a disc golf course and that uh, the mere presence of people there should not be something that causes such an upset as seemed to happen last week. Yeah. Uh, Nick, I've got a question. Yeah. Once I just want to clarify one thing. There is a, the group that I'm referring to, uh, there's a, a group of five folks that are pretty prominent um, that do the general maintenance every year. Uh, they, they do, uh, they put wood chips down the town, give them wood chips. They'll take care of it. Um, if they're, I don't know if they're in a, you know, Steve and I met with them. <clears throat> they're, they're, they're like the, uh, the go-to folks for the, the chains. One of them is on the DRB. Uh, so when I talk about MOU, I'm just referring to that, that group that Steve and I are aware of. And Bill, I can share that contact information later. Yeah. I'm, I'm had a that, that's fine. Thank you. Yeah. What was the question? Um, I had a question about um, their affiliation. Um, the, the disc golf course. Um, I've, I've had a long history with the mountain biking community and um, the trails on Perry Hill. And um, is there any affiliation with this group with any, like, any parent group of disc golf or are they just their own thing? They no, they they belong. I, I don't know off the top of my head. They are affiliated with uh, some some other parent uh, leagues, and I I think that uh, yeah, I'd have to do some more digging. Um, but but they're definitely affiliated with some. Just like just like uh, the you know some of the leagues that rent Dak Rose Field, they're affiliated with a larger league. They're the this golf is definitely the prominent users of it are affiliated with this other group. I need to reach out to, to them and get a little bit more back background on it. But um, yeah, to answer your question, they, they are. I just don't know exactly what the name is. Miss okay. Allie, would you like to speak? Um, I have a, a, an addition to what Tom said. Can I share? I would say, um, I do know there is, Meg, you know the name of that group, right? I do. What is it? It's called uh, Disc Golf Vermont. So there's the, your answer. Um, so um, <laughs> I love that you called me Miss Allie. Uh, yes, I would like to piggyback off of what Tom said. Um, I'm, I love the Hope Davy Park and I am a PE teacher in the district. And one of my main goals is to get children interested and capable of participating in um, lifelong activities, which include disc golf, hiking, cross country skiing, snowshoeing and running. Um, all are activities that you should be able to do at Hope Davy um, on the trails or that were that's what's posted anyway. Um, I do have several concerns with the domination of the 
um, parks trail use by the users. Um, it seems as though the notion of multi-use shared space has been pretty lost. Um, and unfortunately, I've had several really uncomfortable encounters with people using the course. And I'm not going to go into any details about any specific incidents, but um, some recurring incidents include loose dogs that wander um, into my yard daily, almost never coming back when their owners call them, and sometimes defecating in my backyard. Um, people choosing to urinate facing our house and on our property, as well as beer cans getting tossed into our bushes and many people using the course when it's closed for mud season. Um, and we just talked about how people have been berated for using the trails for alternate purposes, even if they're not in a direct path. Um, and even though it is supposed to be a shared space. Uh, I do want to be clear that I love that our community has this resource on public land and most of the disc golf users are respectful um, and many of them are friends of mine. Um, I'm just bringing these issues to light because I believe that as a community we can do a bit of work to find a balance and a better understanding for use of the space as a community recreation area as well as improving general respect between folks who neighbor the course, course users and people coming to the park for alternate activities. Um, and just throwing out the idea of maybe having more of a committee for the park to help oversee the improvements and community relations and park use. Thanks. Mark? Uh, I mean, it sounds similar a little bit to some of the issues we had with the skate park in that area of just, uh, you know, the, the shared overlap of space and respect and of course the community that's tightly knit around it. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we can do only so much with signage. And then um, I, I looked up at, I think it's called the Center Chains Disc Golf Club, but I don't know how well organized they actually are. Um, but I am interested in learning more about this and seeing if we can come up with some solutions. I mean, I'm sure there are some things we can do. Otherwise, you know, it's going to come down to and, and that's where I'd have a question to Bill on, you know, what would the state police right now respond to when it comes to public urination, that kind of stuff? And is that our suggestion that they should just be calling the state troopers on something like that? And I, I know no one wants to be that person. Yeah, that's, but I mean, that's, that, that's, a, that's a challenge. And I think all of the things that we've talked about uh, and heard about are, are good suggestions, certainly upgrading the signs uh, I see Bill Minter is on the call. Bill is on the Recreation Committee. I, I hope we don't need another committee. I think, you know, the Rec Committee can can be uh, the eyes and ears of, of the town with the public on something like this. Um, you know, education is important. I know that uh, the state police were called the other day because, you know, the incident that was, uh, that I described earlier. And, you know, unfortunately, like everything else, the state police can't be everywhere at once. And uh, the person who called the state police, uh, I think quite understandably, didn't have the names of the people. There was a, a pretty intimidating altercation and she called the police to report that. And the police told her that, well, without knowing who it was or having a, a car or anything else, we really, nothing we can do about it. Um, and, you know, I'm not, I'm not advocating necessarily for, for more recreation staff, but the physical presence of people at the facilities that have some authority is part of the solution to a problem like this. You can have all the signs that you want, and as Ali just said, you know, if 95% of the people are really good people, but you have, you know, 200 people using it, there's there's 10 people that are problems. And uh, trying to just deal with those 10 people as an individual out there trying to enjoy yourself is, is intimidating, it's uh, discouraging, and it's exhausting, frankly. So, um, uh, you know, I think, I think the thing to do now is to, you know, allow staff to make some recommendations uh, you know, if there's some public urination going on, you know, if you can get their name, you can tell the state police and maybe they can do something about it. 
Um, Pictures. <laughs> well, yeah, if you take a picture, then maybe you're going to get, you know, public shaming. From, you know, taking a picture. Would hate to share like, them, but they exist. <laughs> anyway, um, we we understand your issues, and nobody. I, I know the select board are concerned about it, and I want all of you to know the staff is concerned about it as well. Uh, we'll do what we can. Um, I think Nick and the rent committee can talk about this kind of stuff in terms of what other um, uh, measures we might take. Public education is, is the biggest part of it. I also think that being considerate of the people who are playing is part of the deal too. You know, if somebody's if somebody's getting ready to throw a disc down at a at a at a, a a basket, and I'm not suggesting this happened the other day, but if people are playing on the golf course, you shouldn't expect that you can just walk straight across fairway number five, for example. You know, you've got to you've got to give as well. It's a shared use facility but they have the, the right to use the facility too. So I think it goes, goes both ways. I, I would just add to that, uh, the public urination and, and the fecal incidents happening, the, that just got brought to my attention last week. So uh, it's part of planning in the future. We'll put, we'll put another portal at maybe, hopefully we can put it closer to the, the froth course. Obviously we can't go out there and police people like Ali said take some pictures we can post it we can sh publicly shame them but uh hopefully maybe per well, what we can do now that we've known we know these issues is work on you know you know the actual park itself and can we provide a facility out there that maybe makes it easier for some of these people to go use it in conjunction with sign and just says hey if you need to use the bathroom you know please please use the portalette it could cause x y and z for diseases and whatnot um yeah just it's just like Bill said, staff will work on it. Um, you know, we're just getting brought uh, this stuff to our attention. So there's things that we can do certainly um, next spring to help, hopefully help start mitigating some of these problems. And the loose dogs are relentless. It's awful. So that's another big one. Well, where are we at with a dog catcher? Bill, you're not muted. Same, same place we've been at for months. Yeah, we have one. Bill Mintner, do you want to go? Yeah, thanks. So I just want to, as Bill suggested, kind of volunteer the Recreation Committee to um, work on this issue um, and to support Nick, um, but especially to support um, the attempt to have the various uses of that space be, you know, created in a way that can be compatible. Um, and it's going to be important as we move forward um for neighbors to be represented and to show up and represent um for bikers for runners for all the different uh participants um and uh you know i'd like to get together you know i'd like to connect with dave frothingham and see who is really uh waterbury chains now and make sure we get that group on board um the good experiences that we've had with various organizations like wada is that uh, when you have an organization that's involved with those trails, they start to actually be very successful in policing those trails. Um, and they're better at policing the trails and making the changes than uh, Nick or staff or somebody coming in. So uh, we have a situation here where, you know, Waterbury Chains really needs to step up and police their own. We've got some people giving a very bad name to uh, a great sport, um, a great area, and really, you know, all of the recreation um, because it just makes our outdoor recreation look bad. So th I think there's a lot of interest in trying to curb the behaviors that have just been described. Um, and I'd like to see some folks like Tom and Meg and Allie and some of the golf people and stuff will not wait until spring, but get together sooner than later um, and see what we can do, you know, going forward to get people together. And I, I hope I'll get a chance to say it later, but in case I don't, I just want to say, if we do come up with a time to meet or especially a work day, it'll be very important for um, you to get involved in picking that day so that you can be sure to show up on that day. Because we've had issues like this throughout the history of the course. And too often the folks who wanna represent the community path or other activities on that work day, 
they show up in very low numbers or don't show up. And we've got, you know, 40 disc golfers working hard to try to build a trail for the community path people, but they're not there to tell them where they want the path. So um, I think that's going to change. We have more neighbors involved and we'll be able to have a stronger input. I know that the, the committee for um, center trails is trying to get a community path, uh, bike path through there. So there's another interested party. So I think, um, you know, we should be able to get people working together to establish a clear path and safe ways for these uh, different activities to be compatible in the same location. All right, I'm gonna go Nat, then Mike, then Meg, um, but we do need to move on. But I think we're, we've definitely heard that, you know, we're gonna continue to work on this. And some of those questions, I think about hours of operation, we can do offline and get that information to you and then decide if anyone's uh, doing anything they shouldn't be. Uh, Nat, go ahead. So yeah, thank you, Bill, for your words. Um, so I have been, I mean, I, I moved to Waterbury Center uh, before there was even a disc golf course. And I used to walk my dog through those woods and um, <clears throat> there was never a disc golf course there. And so those are all just jogging trails and walking trails. And I snowshoed through there in the winter. And so this thing is, this whole thing is evolved. But as we know about everything in Waterbury, everything has evolved. There, you know, um, the Waterbury trails um, have evolved. And we know from studies that uh, even though we call them mountain bike trails, half of our users are on foot. You know, so it all seems to me like this Frisbee golf course um, it's a, it, it's something like we ran into when I was with WADA where, um, we weren't having any problems with conflicts between runners and, uh, bikers and hikers. We were having a problem between horses and bikers and horses and walkers, you know, and, uh, it almost seems like it's just a, it, it, it's a problem of, uh, of synergy of the uses. And it's almost become something that is unsustainable in its current state. There are people who want to walk out there. There are people who want to jog out there. And there are people who want to chuck really, really hard discs of rubber. And that's a problem for the walker. So, you know, it kind of seems like it's one of those things where we're in this position where everybody wants to use it, but it, it, it's become unfriendly to everyone. And that's all I've got to say. <laughs> you nailed it. Mike and then Mike. Yep, I just want to dovetail a little bit on what Bill said. I'm a big believer in education and I think the best place for education. Yes, signs do work to some extent, but the users and the neighbors have to educate uh, folks who are using the facility. I know I've been at Hope Davy, and you know, especially after the instances we had with, um, I went there and folks were parking, you know, in the wrong spot. They were parking by the fire, where the fire department didn't want them to be. And sometimes it's just education. You know, if you approach them in a very nice way, they said, oh, I didn't realize this was an issue. And I, I, you know, I did that a couple of times and it was different people and they just were not aware. And sometimes it's a matter of, you know, everyone likes to complain, but sometimes it's just a matter of saying, you know, most people are reasonable and they're going to take, oh, I, you know, I'll do this. It's, the few people that will be very belligerent, it's like, no, this is a disc golf. And ultimately, you know, the people who are using it saying, if you're not going to try to obey by the rules, we may not have this disc golf course, you know, and I think that's going to get people to change their behavior. You, you, there's no way we could have 10 rec staff policing this. And of course, we can't afford that. But the people who use it really have to police and be 
our eyes and ears. I'm not saying that the rec staff can't be there on and off, but also neighbors, if you see, just kindly say, you know, most people are going to be pretty good. Oh, I didn't realize this. You know, you know, everyone has, especially, I, I think it's bad if someone, def, you know, if someone relieves themselves on your property, but if they went way out in the woods somewhere. I don't think anyone's going to know any, any different from it. Uh, I think we, we just need to rely upon education from the users, maybe educate some of the key users to say, hey, if there's not some change and you got to be the advocates of change, you're going to lose the right to use it. That's all I have to say. I think Meg's up now. Hi, everybody. Um, I just want to share that I actually was the person who um, had the encounter last week and um, it was a really tough one. There's been a lot of things. Um, I thought that I was alone in, in some of the stuff and have learned that actually a lot of folks are experiencing, you know, some level of, um, we'll just call it like unpleasant to very unpleasant, <laughs> intimidating, um, targeted perhaps um, encounters. And I think Hearing what everybody's saying, I want to first thank you to Bill and all our town people for the, you know, hanging on to the fact that this is shared public space to all of our community and we want to go forward in shared space. I really think that, um, look, I've really dug into this because the dynamic of it has just become really bizarre over the course of really this year and I can share a couple things, okay. My observation is that we went for, you know, years. I know there's always been conflicts and it's really easy to kind of go into this neighbors versus, you know, somehow the a disc golf players. And honestly, everybody, I don't feel that. Folks who abut the fields don't feel that. I think that's a, frankly, it, it's a very old sort of narrative as Annette was saying, like we've evolved, like we've all evolved and we know this. So having that narrative of like, oh, the neighbors, you know, think there's trails, but oh, they don't quite get that the world of disc golf has exploded. That's just not it at all. So like Bill's saying to involve the um, rec um, whole committee, we really want to open this up to a much broader um, a conversation with all you know, stakeholders, there's a lot of people in town, a lot of people not represented here. I'm speaking for lots of people that I know who really thought that the whole thing was gone years ago to become a disc golf course. They don't even know, you know what I mean? Like people don't know, people don't bring their kids here. Like you don't see young moms out there with kids. It's not safe from a physical viewpoint of, of discs, but even aside from that, the whole vibe, it really has been dominated by the disc golf course. And a lot of us love the fact that we have a disc golf course. Like we really do. Like I'm excited about getting my team going. I just haven't been able to in COVID, you know, and I know Allie <laughs> teaches it. I mean, it's like, there's a lot of us, there's a lot of women in town, a lot of kids in town, and we want to involve them, which means even more people are going to be on the course. I don't see a lot of women on the course. There's a small group that seem to be playing now in a more organized way. I love that. So I'm just saying, I love this and I want it to all become like really together. However, one really important observation I have, and I've really dug into this to try to understand the dynamic, like why is this so difficult, is center chains, and please correct me if anybody, you know, if I'm saying something wrong, but I've tried to understand it. If you go to our sign, it says center change disc golf course, which we all think is like our local course, right? We're like people are playing, you know, golf here. That's great. But disc golf Vermont is actually an organization which is paired with Smuggler's Notch. Like this is not about Waterbury Recreation. This is about a much larger and broader group. I mean, these are like corporate groups and corporations. We even have a corporation that was in town that was called Center Chains Disc Golf. Oh gosh, I lost the name of it. And, and a, one of our community members and a person who's involved in our government is like the president of this 
corporation whose goal is to expand disc golf. And so most recently when they just had this work day, which just kind of happened, I mean, I guess within the community or whatever, but um, like the, the pads, like the things that you throw from, like, like, I don't think me and my team need those. You know what I mean? Like, like, I don't even think the intermediate teams need them. Those pads are for people who are playing professionally. And what I've figured out after trying to put the pieces together, because I'm like, why am I being ordered off, told to leave the course? This is our course. This is a Frisbee golf, or excuse me, disc golf course. This belongs to us. And it's like, what? Like, this is getting weirder and weirder and weirder. So I dug in and I might be incorrect, but I think the issue is that we have a lot of players who are playing like in leagues and professionally. Like we've had leagues running every single week in this park, like for months and months and months. It's, and I mean, maybe there's casual games, there's individual users, like there's mixed use and there's still people trying to walk and there's all the people who have given up trying to walk and all that. But we have a very, or a very tight knit community of really, really avid golfers. And they're not just like, oh, this is Waterbury locals enjoying a sport. It's part of Disc Golf Vermont is a corporate entity that's growing disc golf nationally. So my question is, as a community, and I think that we need to open this up really broadly to all stakeholders. Do we, like, do we have the space and the will to actually host, to have our little local field that we all want to use and we're going to have like tons of kids out there and tons of women like me and who even knows or I mean Tom might even play you know what I mean is there going to be room when there's not even room now how do you how do you marry the needs of a professional uh organization like some of these folks I'm sure they play recreation I thought we had a recreation area but over the course of many years I've looked at this and I'm gonna to continue to look and we have lots and lots of questions and, and you guys will get them. Why is it that our course is being more and more developed for this one particular entity that isn't even, okay, maybe the guy who's the president of it who started a, corp, a nonprofit corporation years ago, like there's a lot of money being transacted. There's a lot of money exchanging hands right in our parking lots. It's like. There's a whole thing that has nothing to do with people who are like, oh, by the way, I'm throwing a disc. Will you, you know, like maybe you didn't know I was throwing. So I think uh, we, need, I, we need a town group. We need to flush this out. It's not, it's not about signage, although thank you, Nick, signs are good. And, you know, but our signs that we have don't work. I think it probably, it's, it again, extends the conversation. First of all, you know, you have groups like WADA for the mountain bike group. They're a part of a, a larger group called uh, Mountain, or uh, Nat, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Vermont Mountain Bike. Vemba, yeah. Vemba. So you have these organizations that start to organize, I think, as, as, as these smaller areas grow in popularity and they do start to organize, you start to see them associate themselves with more national organizations and in that specific sport, I think a lot of what you're seeing are these tournaments. I know we do have a, one of the like higher level players that are that lives in town. Um, I think at this point, it, I hear you. I think that it makes sense that Bill's group with Nick and the town start to work on where are we at currently? What are the problems? What can we do in its current form? And then look at a five, 10 years out. Do we need to look at other options? Are we growing too big? Just like the skate park discussion of at some point, does this need to go somewhere else and become the popularity isn't always a bad thing, but it can also grow outside of the boundary that we built it in. And there's more houses that have now been built right there across in the post office. So I expect that we're going to hear more and more problems there. Ali backs up to it and it's having problems. I remember years ago that dog ran into somebody's uh, dog door. I mean, this isn't the first time I've heard about problems. Luckily, I mean, for the amount of use, I've been on the board for I think seven or eight years now and I, I this is one of the first conversations I really feel like I remember hearing about concern so I, I think that's a good and bad thing so um, I think we just need to take it seriously and have our 
you know, the re look at the resources we have, see if they can address these issues. If they can't, well, you know, we can address them from there. Um, Allie, go ahead. And then I think we- This is real quick, I promise. Um, but Mike, you were mentioning about it's important to educate people and speak up in a respectful way. And that's exactly what I've done um, since I've been there. Um, I don't, I think some of you know me, I'm a pretty reasonable, kind, like I approach people in a, in a pretty friendly way. And you'd be really surprised at some of the, the comments that I get back. Um, I was told, oh, I thought this was America when they were out on the very obviously closed course, when there were signage over the parking lots, over the, um, the walking bridge, it was very obviously clear that it was closed and there were people out there all day, every day still. And I would guess, say, hey, you guys, like the, the course is closed, just letting you guys know. And they're like, oh, really? We didn't know. And I'm like, well, maybe you should learn to read. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't say that, but it's like, how more obvious can it be? And I have said, hey, your dog's over here. Please leash them if they don't listen. And, you know, you get comments. And it, I've, I've tried. And I, I don't want to be like the nasty neighbor that everybody okay. hates. So I've kind of stopped doing that because I really want it to be more of a community worked out problem. I don't want it to just be on me. So, and that's um, where, that's where if you're going to be nice and you should be nice is say, Hey, if, if you're not going to try to work with people, work with your neighbors, this ain't going to be available to you. And no one wants to shut the disc golf course down, but if you're going to have bad actors, maybe that might mean, something because that's why I think the group itself needs to police each other, you know, police their, their fellow players. And if you're not, I see this all the time. I work with a lot of sportsmen's groups and there are a lot of bad actors in the sportsmen's community, but there are a lot of good hunters and fishermen and we don't like bad things happening either. And I say, you know, ultimately they're going to shut this area out from hunting. You know, if, if, if you're going to be shooting bullets into signs and stuff like that so you know you, you just you know i'm a big believer in education and i think Allie, you're doing the right thing it's just a matter of i think getting some of the internal people to advocate for you as well i agree they're a tight-knit community similar to mountain biking i think once the word gets in that the town has got an eye on them and there are concerns from neighbors we can put out a pretty good message that says you know knock it off and start policing your your people or we're gonna have to step in and do something um tom go ahead and then we're one, gonna we're gonna have to move on unless there's other public no, i have one sentence discussion. go ahead um that i ask that the town ask whoever is doing it to cease destruction and construction while this is being figured out they're dropping healthy trees eight ten inch 20 25 year old trees just dropped and cleared because they don't want them in the way of the discs. They're building, building, building. I just think while we're in this state, stop oh. destruction, stop construction until there's a plan and approval by Bill and the select board. Yeah, Bill, can you talk about that real quick in terms of any kind of agreement that we've had either verbally or on paper about their ability to modify the course in any way? Or maybe Nick, you can speak to that. Yeah. Um, the uh, the cutting of trees is certainly not uh, condoned. It's not something that I knew about until just just now, till tonight. You know, EFA, the former village, the Edward Fry Utility District, has this issue in the watershed up off of uh, Sweet Farm Road, where you know we've got again uh, people who use those trails, like Nat was indicating, and. Most people are fine and do what they're supposed to do, but there's a there's a group of rogue individuals who just decide, well, you know, I want my trail to go this way, and they they cut trees, and you know, when it's a tree, once it's cut, it's kind of too late. So uh, that's something that we'll have to look into. I think Tom, your suggestion is good. Uh, Nick can reach out to the to the folks that he calls the the core users and tell them that. You can't cut trees and you can't build anything without permission, stop. Uh, if that's happening, I'm very concerned about it. Mark, can I ask one question before we jump chip on this? Yep, go ahead, Chris. Okay, Bill, can, can you refresh our memory there? Wasn't there some form of an agreement with the 
new development across from the post office. I, the name of the development escapes my mind. Um, when Paul Reed originally had it, wasn't there an agreement with the town as far as being part of the whole park trail system and whatnot? And was there any covenants in there that pertain to any of the guidelines as to what could be done with it? Well, at one point, and you know, my memory is not uh, razor sharp on this, but um, the disc golf course, I think for a time actually spilled over onto private land. And when Paul Reed went to develop it, uh, he didn't want that on that property, of course. And there was some pushback among some of the players who like to play, but it wasn't our property. So we, you know, way back in the day, there was an MOU with the Wadbury Chains group. Um, uh, uh, I, well, I, I can remember a couple of the people who were involved then. I'm not sure they still are now. So I, I think we're at the point where we've shared as much information as we have right now. We're going to have to reach out to this group. I think uh, Bill Minter and the Rec Committee can be very instrumental in this. I think that you know their their volunteers who are appointed by the Select Board to to you know be the eyes and ears not only to identify needs but concerns with recreation. So. I think working with Nick and them, and then reaching out to other people who aren't on the committee, certainly Meg and Tom and Allie and others who might be interested, but I think that's really where it needs to start. The rec committee and Nick have to begin at least gathering some information and uh, communicating with the, with the organized group, if you will. And then as Mike says, education is good. Uh, this is going to take a little bit of time, I think. We're we're at the end of the the season right now. I don't know if they play all winter long or not, but uh, we'll try to get the message out every day. Cut trees. They can't cut trees, and they can't uh, disturb the ground. That's not theirs to to do that with. And every day. Yeah, and and I I understand because you know it, it was several years back. It wasn't a disc golfer, but there was a, a, a couple of people who were going out there to, to hike and it was mud season. I, I happened to be there at the Hope Davy Park and I met him at the bridge and I told him, you know, you can't go out there. Um, it's closed because of, of, of mud and you're going to damage the, the, uh, the facility and, and, and it's, it's not a place where you can go. And, and the guy looked at me like I had three heads and I said, look, the state has closed down, you know, the hiking trails. Uh, and, and he basically said, well, you know, I'm kind of a rule breaker. I, you know, rules are there, but I'm someone who likes to push the envelope. It's like, yeah, okay. So I understand exactly the kind of people that you're talking about. And, uh, it's a small minority of people, but they do really spoil it for everybody. I was just gonna say it's the Knowles and it is not in covenants for them to be, uh, to have any right of way through that land. Right. And I would say if any of the neighbors see people cutting or doing any kind of alteration like that, take pictures. Take pictures goes a long way in, in, in a court. And if, you know, you know, we should have redress if if they're cutting trees on public land. That's just not cool. All right, we're going to move on from this topic. Thank, Thank you, you so much. And we'll continue to make sure this is uh, addressed. Um, is there anybody else from the public that would like to speak during the public session on another topic? All right. If, uh, we're good there. We're going to move on to the select board items. First one is the library director's report. Um, on me. Thank you very much for being patient and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, so we're going to transition from outdoors to indoors to talk about the library. Um, the members of the select board probably received um, a document from me through Carla that had just a little timeline about what the library has been, been doing for <clears throat> since March. Um, so for the benefit of some of you from who are 
probably didn't receive that. I'll just um, mention really quickly, we closed on March 18th, uh, which was the same day the schools closed. And we began virtual youth programming April 9th, uh, virtual adult programming May 13th. We started our curbside service on May 19th. Uh, we had a summer reading program uh, June, July, and August. Uh, we started a walk-in service on a limited basis on July 15th. Uh, on August 11th, uh, interlibrary loans were able to resume. And on November 2nd, just a couple of weeks ago, we expanded our hours. And then just to give you a, an update on a timeline situation um, with the governor's new orders and the spike of cases in Washington County, uh, we made the decision to close to in-person service uh, starting last Saturday. So all of our hours are once again returned to curbside uh, for who knows how long. So um, I wanted to just give you kind of an overview of uh, the situation with libraries and COVID. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. I have a few slides to show you as I, as I talk. So let me... Uh, okay, Carla, uh, I have a share screen button, but it says host has disabled it. Are you able to switch that for me? Mine says that one participant can share at a time. Okay, let me try. Oh, I don't. Oh, hang on. I think I can. Okay. Give it a shot. Is that, is the slideshow visible for people? No. No. Okay. Share screen. I went into advanced sharing options and checked that all participants can share. How about now? Yeah. There we go. All right. Okay. So. So librarians all over Vermont are doing their best to serve the public within the bounds of state and CDC guidelines and the limitations of our own buildings and staff, which as you can imagine, vary a great deal from, from town to town and city to city. Uh, here in Waterbury, we are so fortunate to have a modern building with plenty of windows, a good ventilation system and space to accommodate people indoors. Um, so we have pivoted to a limited, a more limited library service that has more of a transactional focus uh, rather than a, uh, you know, a broader sort of living room of the community focus. Um, and that's been challenging, but it's also been uh, rewarding. Uh, we're still serving the community. Let me advance my slides here. Uh, we're, still, we're still serving the community and um, all of the staff uh, with the support of the commissioners have worked hard to adapt our services to fit the required health and safety protocols. Here's our staff in case, whoops, sorry, in case you haven't met all of them. Uh, we have three full-time staff and four part-time staff. Um, so some of, the, some of the work we've done came, has come to fruition in the following manners. Uh, we have done thorough health and safety training for the staff, just like businesses have done with policies and procedures in place uh, for both staff and visitors, including uh, transforming our interior space so that it's a safe place to visit while adhering to COVID standards. Uh, we have taken the lead on the Waterbury Cares program, which matches volunteers with neighbors who need assistance with things like grocery shopping, prescription pickup, um, connecting them with meals on wheels, um, check-ins and other, other things as well. Uh, we have been an outlet for masks, first from Makersphere in the early days, which was fabulous. Um, and now the ones from the, that we, the town received from the state uh, and that's ongoing. People are still taking masks. Um, we, transition to virtual programming. And many of them seem to be providing a nice sense of continuity and community, despite the fact that people sometimes 
are weary of Zoom meetings. <laughs> uh, we started a YouTube channel where we post a lot of our um, programs uh, recording so that people can watch them at their leisure. We have also instituted uh, some outside programming with safety protocols in place, of course. Things like uh, the story walk that we had in the garden uh, all summer long, uh, community poetry walk, which was, um, which was really fun, musical munchkins, a Halloween program, and we are planning to participate in some way in Winterfest as well. Um, and we have been quarantining our materials that are returned to us after being in patrons' hands and patrons' homes. Uh, according to the most up-to-date information that we have, there are some studies that have happened through some federal agencies about the viability of, of the virus on materials. So we're following that very closely. Um, we are offering tech help by phone and email. This is uh, one of our newer staff people on the left there, Kyle. He's our, our tech uh, librarian. Uh, we've also beefed up all the information and resources available on our website, including some really nice resources for families who are either homeschooling or schooling at home. Um, and we also, especially in the, the first few months, we shifted a lot of our materials budget into more digital content, eBooks and downloadable audiobooks, uh, so that people could access that. And uh, you, you may have seen on our on the second page of the document that I sent through Carla that our, um, our digital material use, as was the case with many libraries across the country, really skyrocketed during that time. Um, we have been guiding many people via phone and email through the process to access all of our digital materials. From the very beginning, we've been answering our phones six days a week for our full pre-COVID hours. Um, fielding, you know, thousands of questions about accessing um, uh, digital uh, resources and, and other things. Um, and more recently, just, in, you know, since we were able to have some in-person uh, contact in July, especially, uh, it's been great to be able to restart our work with some of our community partners like the Food Shelf and the Winter Clothing Drive and uh, be able to offer those things at the library. Um, in October, our physical circulation bounced back to about 66% compared to October of last year. And our total circulation, meaning physical and digital items, uh, reached 82% of what it was in October of 2019. Interlibrary loans have rebounded up to, uh, towards, towards more normal volume at about 77% last month. Uh, we registered um, 13 new patrons in October, eight were Waterbury taxpayers and five were non-residents. Uh, and between March 18th and October 31st, we registered 86 new patrons at the library. So during times of economic distress, public libraries become an even more important resource for the community. Um, in the 2007 to 2010 Great Recession, public Public libraries, and this is a, this is a, na a national um, statistic, saw about a 25% increase in use. And this represents everything from families and senior citizens sort of tightening their, their belts um, by borrowing rather than buying, um, to job seekers filling out online applications, to folks getting help with unemployment claims, um, and then attending all the free programs and much more. Uh, we have been doing our part in Waterbury to try to reduce 2020 spending by implementing layoffs at the beginning of this, uh, reducing staff hours, um, especially in the first few months, several months, along with the other town employees who did likewise, um, voluntary pay cuts, reducing line items in the budget, and trying to be very conservative with our spending. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, positive response and appreciation expressed by the taxpayers for being open, um, which is gratifying, and we are pleased to be serving the community despite the challenges of operating during the pandemic. Um, and I invite you to stop in and visit and get a card if you don't already have one. 
like our Facebook page, sign up for our newsletter, uh, and help us spread the word that despite the fact that like all businesses now, it looks a little different, but the library is open for business. And I wanna thank you for giving me some time on your agenda and for your attention. And I'm happy to answer or try to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm in a similar problem with public facing and I appreciate you guys figuring out how to continue to serve the public in a safe, safe way. Um, does anyone have any questions for Almi? Katie, um, go ahead. So I know you guys talked about doing a book pickup where people can um, request books and then come and pick them up at your location. Have you guys ever thought about bringing back the bookmobile and like possibly driving it around to like local daycares and having people have the option to browse quickly and then check one out and then driving around and having that um, option for other community members as well? Uh, bookmobiles are great. I have fond memories of one in my town when I was growing up. Um, they are very expensive. Uh, I think there's there's only a handful of them in the whole state of Vermont because they're they're very expensive to purchase, um, get set up as a bookmobile, and then to run it. Uh, so I don't I don't really see that in our future. I mean, I suppose if we knew for sure that we were going to be in this kind of a lockdown situation for five years, maybe we would try to look into that. But I I just don't think it's practical for us. Um, when we when we were able to, before the pandemic, we did have some outreach programs. We had a staff member who was going to, um, I think it was about five daycares in Waterbury, um, and I think one in Duxbury that's you know right over the line, uh, and doing little story hours and bringing them bags of books. Um, so we did, and we also provided, um, uh, a home delivery for people who were uh, sh shut in for one reason or another, whether they had surgery and they were recovering or they didn't have a car or whatever the situation was, we, uh, we, we, would do, we didn't have a huge demand for that, but we did make that available to patrons. Um, so I hope that that helps answer your question. And nice to meet you, Katie. Anyone else? Thank you very much for uh, giving us an update. You're um, welcome. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. I think I will bow out for the rest of the meeting. So take care, everybody. Thanks, Almy. Good night. Um, Bill, I think you're probably going to take this, discuss property tax delinquencies. Yes. So um, I sent out a memo this afternoon just to update the board on uh, where we are with regard to tax collection and to kind of re-engage the discussion that the select board has had a couple of times during the, the course of the pandemic um, about penalty or interest on unpaid bills. So as I said at the beginning of the meeting, um, uh, I got tied up on a different meeting. I'm home right now. I don't have any of my information with me. I can remember uh, in round numbers though. So in 2019, uh, we had about 155 taxpayers that did not pay uh, as of the due date. And our collection rate uh, was just slightly less than 98% last year. We had a 2.15% um, delinquency rate. So out of the $15 million that we built last year, uh, we had collected all but about, and here's, you know, just from memory, about $340,000 or so. Uh, you have that number in front of you if you have my memo. This year, uh, because we set the tax rate at 51 cents as opposed to 55 cents as authorized, uh, the amount of money that we actually billed was only about $400,000 more than last year. Initially, it was supposed to be about $725,000 more, but we set the tax rate lower, um, figuring that uh, a goodly number of people would have difficulty paying. So this year, the, the delinquency rate was 4.8%. 
uh, we have about 2.3 times more outstanding uh, on the day after uh, tax collection date this year than we did last year. So well over $700,000. Uh, still remains unpaid as of 4.30 on uh, Friday afternoon. Um, the, the number of taxpayers that are delinquent is actually slightly less than it was last year. I think it's about 140 or something like that. Um, but I did quickly compare the lists and uh, uh, there are about 47 people or taxpayers, because some of the taxpayers are businesses. Um, there's about 47 of the delinquent taxpayers who are on both lists. So that means there's about 95 people on this year's list that weren't on last year's list. And I'm not suggesting that they all never have been on the list before, but um, you know, it's it's hard to extrapolate the reasons why folks are late. But the fact that it is significantly higher, you know, more than two times higher, uh, indicates to me that this is uh, COVID has to be a big uh, player in this uh, situation. So the normal course of action is, um, if you didn't pay your taxes by 4:30 on on Friday, we would impose the penalty and the interest that the voters approved at town meeting, which is an 8% penalty and 1% interest for every month or thereof between now and the end of the year. And then beginning on January 1st, it goes up to 1.5%. Um, I had Karen Petrovich, the, um, the tax clerk today, we didn't push the on the, uh, you know, push the switch to to add the penalty and interest to those outstanding bills right now, because I needed to have this conversation with you folks first. Um, as I indicated in the memo, we do have the capability of allowing taxpayers to pay by credit card. Um, we have over 2000 taxpayers, 30 of them chose to pay by credit card. Um, and that's not a high percentage. And um, I, I didn't compare to last year how many paid by credit card. But my guess is that at least some of those 30 uh, used the credit card to pay their taxes on Friday to avoid a, a 9% immediate hit. Um, in order to pay by credit card, they have to, they have to pay a service fee of 3%. So Mark and his business, he probably eats the cost of uh, you know, that transaction on credit cards uh, and, and, and just puts it through and he takes a, a couple percent hit on it. The town does not do that for any of the credit cards uh, transactions that we allow. Um, so the credit card companies that we work with uh, have a means by which to uh, put what they call a courtesy fee on there. So the people who are paying by credit card are actually absorbing that 3% cost. So if somebody has a thousand dollar tax bill, they're paying 30 bucks uh, extra to pay by credit card. So with that information, you know, I kind of think about it a little bit and say, well, a couple of months ago, I had kind of indicated maybe we should not charge penalty and interest at all. Um, we don't charge penalty and interest at all. The people who paid by credit card paid 3% more. Um, if they didn't do that and you waive the penalty and interest, they would be better off than they are now. Uh, we don't have an easy way to um, reimburse or refund that 3% fee because that fee was not paid to us. So if we decided to not charge penalty and interest, um, and wanted to be fair to the people who played by credit card would have to make that payment back to them and frankly would be using tax money to to repay them because we didn't collect that three percent fee so uh, I, i've thought about this a lot since friday but i haven't really talked to anybody except staff <clears throat> so you see my recommendation there is 
perhaps it would be best to say, let's try a 4% penalty. The legislature gave the select board the authority this year and this year alone to change what the, the taxpayers voted at town meeting. So it's within your authority to do that. Um, if, if you charge 4%, uh, kind of rewards the people that chose to pay by credit card last week, just not to be late. They paid 3%. Um, I suppose you could charge 3% and just make it fair all the way around. Um, but I, I think that initially my feeling was that the people that tried to figure out a way not to be late should be rewarded a little bit. Um, so what I proposed to you was charge 4% interest, I mean, 4% penalty and leave it alone after that. Don't, don't add interest onto it. Um, in fact, I would recommend that if you don't charge interest at all right now, we can leave the interest button off. I would suggest given where we are and what things are looking like, uh, we're going to talk about, you know, COVID in, in this region in a little bit. Um, I think that living until April is, um, is reasonable not to charge interest at all. And then at the end of March, the select board can revisit the issue and decide whether or not we should begin to charge that uh, interest at one and a half percent. So if you, if you accept my recommendation and you charge the 4% penalty, because, because we have about twice as much um, delinquencies as we did last year, in the end, you'll, you'll collect about the same amount as you did a year ago. And my goal is not necessarily to collect penalty and interest. It's just trying to find a way to, you know, thread that needle and, and find a way to be fair. And with that, I'll stop, let you folks ask questions, discuss it amongst yourself. I'm not sure there's any right answer. I think what I'm trying to provide is a, is a reasonable way to look at it that gives people uh, who were late for whatever reason uh, a break this year. Um, some people, as I said, um, you know, the, the usual suspects and every town has people that don't pay just because they don't feel like paying or they can't be bothered. Uh, there's no way that we can go through the list and say, oh, you should charge that one 8% and charge this one 4%. Don't charge that one anything. So anyway, I'll stop talking and let you folks ask questions or discuss this amongst yourself. I have an idea, but I don't know if anyone else has any feedback before I kind of step in. I mean, I think it might surprise some that you know, I, I I feel for the people that are impacted by COVID, but there's certain people that maybe, you know, this, this isn't necessarily COVID impact. It's a decision or a mistake that we've penalized at 8% in the past. And, and Bill, I, I think you alluded to it at the end of your comment that you don't think there's a way that we could create something that basically created the discount that you're talking about, but through an ask, uh, you know, there's nothing more than you saying your, your payment is late because you're affected by COVID. And we could say no problem and cut that penalty in half, but not necessarily cut it straight across the board for everybody. If, if you think that's too hard to manage, then I, you know, that's my only comment there. Yeah, I, I, I really don't think that that's feasible. Um, you know, there are some people, if you, if you ask them, you know, they're gonna, they're just gonna say yes, because they think it's a way to get some mercy. Um, I, I think that for me, I think it's really more an all, all, all or nothing thing. That's the way we've done it throughout this whole um, emergency. Uh, when the, when the EFUD commissioners decided to waive base charges, they waived base charges for everyone, for those, you know, there were people who didn't have any problem. They could have paid their water bill without an, without an issue, but um, there's, there's really not a good way for us to be selective about that. So, so IFA just, you know, they waived the base charges for, for everyone. Um, for the UDAG loans that are outstanding, uh, they, they treated all the, the, the borrowers uh, the same way. 
Um, when we cut the tax rate from 55 cents to 51 cents, we did it for everybody. So I think it's, I think it's all for one and one for all. Um, and I, I just don't think there's a way that we can be the arbiter of who's impacted by COVID. What does being impacted by COVID really mean? You know, so I, sure. I don't think that's feasible. Mike, go ahead. Bill, I, I read your memo. I kind of agree with it 100%. But I'm also, it's funny, Mark almost parroted my thoughts. I hate to reward people who just, hey, I didn't get around to it. And I know it may not be, maybe that's just my own personal fi uh, opinion. You know, I had one year that I couldn't get, you know, I usually pay my taxes on the due date. I hate paying any early. And I wound up running into traffic, getting back from the Northeast Kingdom because of construction. And I had to, you know, I just ate the cost. I hated because I paid the next day, but you do it. I hate to reward people who just are tardy. And I just, I don't know if there's, I kind of agree with Mark, but if it's going to be a really all or nothing, I'm probably would lean more to saying, let's just, you know, wave, wave the uh, penalties down to the amount that you propose the 4%. Yeah, I mean, I, I really don't, think, and you know, Karen's on the line, and I'm not going to ask her to speak, but putting, putting staff in the position to hear somebody's story, or having to decide whether this one merits being forgiven and that one doesn't, that's, that's very difficult to do. Can't you just Charging have the penalty is never speaking? easy. Charging the penalty is never easy. Um, and what I always tell people is, Look, this is not my company. Uh, th this is the taxpayer's money. We've got to treat everybody equally. And the easiest way to do that is to say, you're late. Late means late, and the penalty applies. Now, you know, if we had gotten to today and I saw that it was, you know, delinquencies were 10, 15% higher than they were last year, well, you know, I, I, I I think, be, you know, 2.3 times, you know, more than twice as much outstanding. I, I have a hard time that people are just saying, well, um, I'm going to, I'm going to gamble uh, and not pay my taxes because I think the town is going to forgive it. I mean, that, that's a lot of gambling, $400,000 more than last year. Uh, to me, it seems like, you know, it, it, to me, it signals that there are people hurting out there. So um, that's how that's how I looked at it. But Bill, the number is lower, so that's got to be some major, pro like a couple of large properties that must right. have, have been short. Well, right? there's, 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 there's there's a couple of large properties. There's there's no question about that. But uh, you know, see, see, I don't want staff to be an arbiter. I understand what their problem is, but even something, you have a little form, my delinquency was caused by COVID. They sign it, done. Don't, they don't have to, you know, and, and that's kind of in their conscience that if they sign that, that they're saying it's due to COVID, it, it, it's, it's a done deal. But if they can in good conscience sign that, I have no problem charging someone the full amount. Chris, go ahead. I've probably got too many comments and questions here. Obviously, I, and property taxes is probably one of the least exciting things that people have to deal with during the course of the year when it comes to their finances. Um, between the between 2019 and 2020, we were talking about 300 and, oh, where's the figure here? The difference is 424 versus 419. So we're talking about... Hmm. No, it's it's the difference is four nineteen, Chris. Right. It was, was three hundred and something last year, and seven hundred something. Oh, uh, sorry, you're right. Um, so I was looking at the two. That's yeah, that's irrelevant at this point. Um, so I I didn't quite understand. 
you said in the last two years the, the, the delinquencies were 47 each, correct? No, what I said- The number of taxpayers delinquent both years was 47. What you got yeah, here. so there's 95 new people on this list. Uh, there's 95 people on the list this year that weren't on the delinquent list last year. There were 155 people on the delinquent list a year ago, less people this year. You know, I was surprised at that. That was, that was a surprise. But of when you look at the two lists, there's 47 that were delinquent last year and 47 that were delinquent this year. There's 95 new people between this year and last year. I'm not saying they were never on there before. And I want to make clear, I'm not, I'm not advocating uh, for um, reducing this penalty. We've talked about it a number of times during the year. And, you know, when I looked at it, I said, well, especially because there were people that, that used the credit cards to pay, even though it was a small number, I feel they need to get some consideration. If you folks decide, you know what, uh, we've done a lot already for COVID, we've cut the tax rate by four cents, um, you know, EFA has done things. Uh, if you decide that you're gonna just leave it as the voters authorized, I don't have any heartburn about that. I'm just trying to present some information to you if there's an inclination on the board that we need to do something more than that, what I'm suggesting is is 4%. If, if you're all good with just le leaving it at 8%, I mean, we, we, we have that um, interaction with taxpayers well rehearsed, believe me. You know, that, that's every year. We, there's gonna be, no matter whether it's 4% or 8%, if it's more than nothing, there will be somebody who gets pretty hot under the car with Karen and me, and you know, that's just life. So we're not worried about that. We just wanna be consistent, that's all. What I, what I was, a couple of things that I wanted to try to point out here was, um, and it's probably, the, the, the amount is the amount, no getting around that, that's, owed that that is not officially delinquent till after december 31st correct i mean so we're it's not, not officially delinquent in that you can you know, you know you can't act on it to with collection measures you know for tax sale or anything else but it's delinquent as far as penalty is concerned so does it make sense to what i don't want is for the people that right regardless whether they paid by credit card regardless whether they gave up some their vacation so that they could come up with the extra money because they're strapped from covid issues or whatever that paid on time and didn't use a credit card um if we yeah. have to borrow uh unanticipated taxes or make up the difference somehow i don't want the people who've done everything they could and made their payments on time to, to have to take any of this on the chin uh, is there any reason that we couldn't somehow offer the people that are soon to be considered delinquent um, a payment plan of 4% penalty at this point um, if they get on some form of a payment plan? And again, I'm just throwing this out there. Yeah, I, I understand. And um... <laughs> You know, we we do have payment plans for the um, for people who are delinquent. That's our first that's our first um, outreach to them. Please pay, please pay your taxes, and if you can't arrange a payment plan. But you know, as it, as we have this discussion, it occurs to me um, maybe I don't know how you feel about this, um, but. I believe the legislature has given you broad enough authority. You could maybe make a decision right now and say, look, we understand COVID is um, uh, here. We understand that it's been tough for people. Uh, we will extend the, the deadline for paying taxes without penalty until December 31st. Now, you know, there's a bunch of people every single year um, you know, there was one pretty large taxpayer that I know that that sent their tax bill, um, you know, certified mail. Uh, so we had to sign for it. 
they didn't put it in the mail until Thursday and we didn't get it until today. Um, but if you made a decision and publicized it, look, we're going to give a grace period this year, you know, one time only. Um, if you still have outstanding taxes, uh, you have until December 31st or December 30th, whatever the, you know, the last Friday of the month is or something in December, pay it by then and all bets are off. No, no penalty, no interest. And then on December 1st, I mean, on January 1st, impose the 8% penalty. So you, I think you do have the ability to be proactive. And one of the reasons why we didn't decide earlier to uh, make a change in the delinquent uh, penalty was because you folks said, you know, you don't want to advertise that to, to, you know, then people say, well, there's no hurry, then I don't have to pay. So now we know there's 140 people that didn't pay as of Friday. So I think it might be worth considering to just say, we're going to give those 140 people uh, a break until uh, the end of December. And if you can't pay by then, uh, we're real sorry, but we're going to have to impose the penalty. But I would still do it all or nothing. I appreciate Mike's deciding to say, you know, if they sign a form, um, I'd rather not do that. But that's just me. Well, what about bills? Uh, what about delinquencies prior to 2000 and to this year? I mean, are you going to waive those penalties? Are you suggesting no. we waive those too or not? No, I mean, so that the, just the, that's just giving no, bad the, actors. Uh, uh, the, the, you're right. You know the the amount of outstanding taxes that were due before 2020 are are very low now. I mean, by the time we got to February, they were down to like ninety thousand uh, dollars. Karen might know off the top of her head, but I think it's in the you know tens of thousands of dollars range now that are still outstanding. But those those prior years have already had the penalty imposed on them and the interest has accrued to date. Now, it's not possible to shut the interest off. I think if you shut the interest off, it shuts it off for the whole system. Mm -hmm. If those people a break for a couple of months, I don't think that's going to be a killing matter. But I think you can... Uh, yeah. uh, make a decision to put this off. Karen's trying to say something. She'll probably contradict everything I just said. <laughs> I won't do that. I, I can continue to charge interest to 2018 and 2019 delinquencies and okay. not charge interest to 2020. Okay, good. So it, it is on a year by year basis. So I guess I would amend my recommendation then and just ask you to uh, suspend the to delay the date of imposing penalty and interest until, uh, you know, December, December 31st, which is a Thursday. Do you have any indication of, uh, I mean, we didn't raise our tax rate last year, but the education tax went up in dollar amount. I mean, it's irrelevant kind of to this conversation, but do you have any idea on what percentage of that money that's delinquent was a result of increase in taxes? Well, I don't know. I can't tell you how much of it is a result of increase in taxes. I mean, um, I don't have it in front of me, but it's it's pretty easy to uh, the the Break. district gets between seventy five and eighty percent of the taxes bills. So, you know, we build. Um, we should have billed about $17 million this year, uh, and, this, and the state payments were about $1.6 million, so that brought it down to, you know, $15 million, uh, 700 and something thousand, and then we we gave back four cents and didn't collect 325000 or something like that. Um, you know, as far as year-end stuff is concerned, I looked today... Um, we have almost $11 million in the bank right now because, and, and that uh, was all the deposits that were made through Friday. 
Uh, I know there's some, some tax money waiting to go in today that probably hasn't been posted yet. Um, in 20 days, we're gonna have to pay the school districts all of the school taxes that we collected as of the due date. So the same delinquency rate applies. So um, we're gonna have to end up paying the school somewhere north of $10 million in 20 days. Uh, and then between what we have left over and then when we do our borrowing for the capital projects that you authorized at the last meeting, um, I think we'll be going into 2021 with a little bit more than a million dollars cash on hand, which is about normal for us to, to move into the next, the next fiscal year. So I think we're going to be okay on a cash flow basis, but um, anyway, that's where we are right now. And one way or the other, we have to make a decision on if we're going to impose penalty if so, how much, and if so, when. So consideration for pushing it off until the end of the year. Is that something the board's willing to think about or do? Nat, do you have, it looks like you might be contemplating options. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't fully formed my thoughts yet. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, in the end of the day, I want to make sure we're offering some kind of relief for people that are impacted by COVID. Um, you know, delaying the penalty lets, you know, the people that it wasn't COVID related avoid a penalty. But if that means that it gives people time, I think I would probably be supportive of the second recommendation, which I want to make sure is clear is after the December date, it goes to 8%. And one percent is that what's being suggested? Well, that that's your choice. So, I, I think that you can do what you want. I think I think pushing it off until the end of December makes good sense, especially because there's some speculation that people might be kind of wondering or figuring that we're going to delay it, um, and unless you so you can make a motion that just puts off the penalty to the end of december and it's the eight percent it would have to go to one and a half percent i think right away in in january um but are you to, saying right? you had a concern that some people may have paid on time via credit card because of the timing and, and there's a three percent cost to them that if we do this December push, we don't pick, you know, basically it potentially force them to spend an extra 3% where if we did the 4%, your original recommendation, maybe those specific people wouldn't feel as, you know, hurt by the decision to extend it after the date. And then they wouldn't have been forced to pay with a credit card. And I, and I don't think right. we want to be in the business of refunding credit card fees. I think that is, a potentially a big mistake so yeah i don't i don't want to do that either i mean i, I think personally i'm i'm supportive of the for the original recommendation then just so the people that did pay with a credit card feel like there was a reason to pay on time um versus a delay of a month and making the people that paid three percent really feel like maybe we hurt them by doing that is, is my thought Don't want them to feel slighted right mark yeah i just don't I, I hate the idea that you know you you force yourself to make a payment on time try to do the to the right thing and someone can pay a month later and not have a, any extra cost beyond their bill um and these people put it on a credit card because they felt obligated to to, to pay their obligation to the town so i'm supportive of the four percent reduction i don't i don't think i'm supportive of the delay that's why i kind of threw out the four percent you know, uh, you could sign up for a payment plan, you'd still get stuck with 4% so that those people that, you know, for whatever reason used a credit card wouldn't feel slighted, but maybe that just gets into too much difficulty. Uh, I, yeah, I it's, it's, hard, it's hard right now to tie any decision with regard to interest to a payment plan. I mean, Karen's got a lot of administrative work to do over the uh, next little while 
And then, as you said, Chris, when December 31st comes, that's when we uh, can, you know, after December 31st passes, that's when we, they all become technically delinquent and we have uh, means to go forward for collection. And our first step in that collection process is the offering of a payment plan. So I get it. I think that um, if the board is leaning towards keeping the deadline and making it 4%. I think that's a reasonable compromise. And I think that it will take the wind out of the sails of some of the people who might want to complain because it's usually 9%, you know, the people that, that we're opening mail today and tomorrow. Uh, normally we have to tell them it's 9%. And if we tell them this year, hey, it's 4%, um, I think even those people will go away a little happier than they normally are. I don't like the idea of it all, all going to a December 31st due date because one, I don't think that's providing any COVID relief to people. Uh, people who are hurting, but giving them an extra month and a half doesn't really help them. Cutting the amount in half at least helps them in some way. And again, it doesn't hurt as much the people who went and took their charge cards out and paid the extra 3%. So I think what you presented initially is probably the best way to use a 4%. I don't think, you know, again, you know, the person who's just delinquent and will, will complain, they'll probably be happy just getting, you know, paying half as much. So I'm very much in favor of the 4% deal. Even if it does... Katie, I see you're nodding. Nat or Katie, I know you guys haven't really spoken on this. If, if you guys are fine moving forward with Bill's original recommendation, um, we can go ahead and I think make a motion on this. Unless you want, did you have anything else you wanted to say? Am I talking? Okay. Um, you muted yourself again, Katie. <laughs> I was going to say, I am a support of Bill's. Uh, original recommendation, and I'm good to call the question. I agree. Okay, I'll make a motion then to uh, what do me do? Authorize Bill to uh, change the late penalty. Change the, change the late fee percentage from 8% to 4% with no no uh, penalty in it or no interest until the first of the year. For 2020 only. And I had one other question. Are you going to make the uh, interest until the first of the year? I, I suggested until April 1st. So I just want to be clear. It doesn't matter to me. But Sorry, that's right, too. Yeah. My original recommendation March. was yeah. April. Do you want to make that change, Chris, to April? I'm having mic issues. I think that was a yes. I saw you nodding. Um, do I have a second? I second that. Any, uh, Chris, you said you had some further discussion. You had a question? Yeah. I mean, this is all in lieu of, I mean, what happens now and the first of the year, um, COVID heading in the direction that it's headed. Will we still have, we still have the option to make changes later on as well, if, if need be. In other words, if things get so ridiculous with this COVID that, you know, the economics of it becomes really unbearable for some people, what happens at that point? Yeah, you won't, you won't have the ability to revisit this because clearly, you know, um, if this motion passes, tomorrow Karen's going to push a button that applies 4% penalty to everybody who was late this year. And then we'll talk about interest for the 2021 sometime in the February, March timeframe. Um, special considerations that have been given to the select boards, I think are limited right now, <laughs> basically through town meeting. So, you know, you'll have the option to, uh, you know, uh, allow votes 
on budgets and the like to be by Australian ballot for town meeting. That I think the legislature will have to, they're gonna be playing it by ear of course. And if this doesn't get any better for quite some time, they may leave these provisions in place for, for next year. I think they wanna to try to be, allow as much flexibility as possible without having the burden of having to call special town meetings. But right now, I think this is limited to the 2020, early 21 through, uh, through town meeting. And then after that, it reverts back to the way it was. Go ahead. I think the, uh, the thing that you'll have to think about moving forward um, is that you know, when you make these decisions, we've already had people in the past kind of question, why is an 8% penalty necessary? It's punitive, you know? Um, so you've cut it now, there, it, may, it may generate conversation in the future. Um, if we decide to have uh, Australian balloting for our, for our town meeting, um, the law reverts back to the way it was, but I would suspect that we'll have some people pushing, let's do this permanently. But, you know, those are just conversations that we'll have to have. I think the genie's out of the bottle, so to speak, and there will be some people who push for more permanency in these, uh, in these decisions that you're making. But for now, I think this is the right one for this time for penalty and interest. Okay, we have a motion that's been made and seconded. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Just uh, as an aside, I just have a comment to make. I think it's it's a really testament to our citizenry that we only had seven hundred and forty-three thousand dollars in delinquency. I am not belittling that that's a small amount, but to be quite honest, I was expecting a much higher delinquency. So I think our Waterbury people stepped up. And Bill, we're gonna to move to manager's items. Discuss COVID-19 resurgence and impact on municipal operations. Yeah, so I think all of you are well aware that the governor on Friday uh, extended uh, the state of emergency with more restrictions than there have been of late through December 15th. Um, and um, in that, um, I, I, I sent you an excerpt of several that were in the governor's uh, executive order the other day. And there's one section, uh, I don't remember the letter right now because I don't have it in front of me, but uh, there was one section that basically said uh, businesses, including municipalities, should try to limit in-person uh, <laughs> in uh, business as much as possible. I we talked to you already about the fact that uh, on Friday after the governor's directive was made, she immediately um, moved back to just curbside only uh, uh, library services. So nobody's coming in the building. We on the municipal side had opened the building a little bit more than it had been earlier in the year when we were closed completely. Um, except for staff. We have been allowing um, appointment only um, uh, visits into the municipal building. I'm thinking based on a Zoom meeting that I had uh, at 6.30 tonight, uh, at six o'clock tonight, right before this meeting, that um, I think we're probably gonna revert for the time being to the building is just closed to the public. Um, I'm gonna have a staff meeting tomorrow. I'll work with staff and as many people as practicable uh, will be asked to work from home. I'm not planning to lay anybody off right now. Um, 
you know, that would be a, a difficult thing to do uh, and still uh, provide the services that we need. But uh, I can't rule that out in the future if this persists. Um, right now, there's no, uh, you know, CARES Act that if you lay people off, you know, there's no no supplement to the to the state benefits that you get. So if people get laid off right now, um, it's a definite loss of income for them. <laughs> and that isn't the primary concern of the municipality. We have to be concerned first about the taxpayers, but uh, I will be slow to lay off people um, and, and actually cut hours uh, if that can be avoided, I will avoid that. We did have some uh, of the public bodies who were moving back towards meeting in person, the Planning Commission, for instance, uh, the Cemetery Commissioners uh, met in person early last week. Um, that will be stopped for the time being. Um, the, the Governor's Office and uh, Dr. Levine at the Health Department are really trying to restrict gatherings um, from multiple households. Um, the meeting that I was on tonight uh, was called by um, Secretary of Administration Mike Smith and Dr. Levine was, was uh, on there as well. Uh, they had invited uh, Washington County uh, state senators and representatives uh, along with municipal officials to take part in this meeting. Um, things in Washington and Orange County are pretty dicey right now, and they are trying to put a cap on it. So this does not, uh, the situation in these two counties don't spread to the other 12 counties in the state. Um, in the past two weeks, there are 233 new cases in Washington and Orange County combined. Um, there are 50 situations in Washington and Orange County, and a situation, as Dr. Levine described it, is not quite an outbreak, but um, uh, a situation of great concern where there are small core groups where there are one or more cases reported. Uh, they reported that the Four Seasons Rest Home in Northfield has a significant outbreak in their, uh, in their population. Um, they are pretty certain that it was a staff member who brought it in. Uh, they're pretty much closed and the only contact that the, that the patients, if you will, have with the outside world right now are with staff who come and go from home. So uh, they are very concerned about this situation. Uh, Dr. Levine places the blame squarely on uh, parties and social gatherings that happened at Halloween in particular. Um, and then of course, we, we've all read about the, uh, the outbreak that started at the uh, skating rink in Montpelier and it, it was not at the rink itself and people playing the sports, it was the people that were together and they were they were socializing uh, uh, afterwards and uh, not in safe circumstances. I did ask, um, not, not in the form of recommending, but I did ask whether there was any consideration being given in these counties to uh, clamp down on restaurants or other public facilities a little bit more than the state um, directive that we all got on Friday. Uh, bars are closed. Uh, um, restaurants can be open. Mark knows this. Uh, they have to seat. Uh, only people from the same household can go into a restaurant together. They've got um, pretty stringent rules as far as seating is concerned. And, and Dr. Levine said, you know, uh, right now we think restaurants can be open and be open safely provided that the, the, uh, the restaurant management uh, imposes the limits and the restrictions that we put on. And they said if, if everybody uh, behaved 
as if they were in a restaurant when they're in other social gatherings, we wouldn't have this problem. So people going into a restaurant, being adequately spaced apart, being with only people that they're in the same household with and wearing masks, they believe that uh, allowing these businesses to continue to operate is well within the uh, safety factor. But uh, there's a strong concern about people who are gathering with friends. Uh, for those of you who are deer hunters, I, I hadn't heard this, but uh, if you go to deer camp and you go with somebody who is outside your own household, uh, you're supposed to quarantine for 14 days when you come back from deer camp, just as if you went to, to New York or Massachusetts. So uh, they're trying to get that word out. So um, anyway, I think given all of this, uh, you know, their goals are to keep the health system functioning. They're concerned that the emergency rooms and the beds at CVH are starting to fill up at a pace that's faster than that they would like. Uh, they believe keeping schools open is reasonable and can be done safely, provided the schools um, follow all of the directives that they have been issued. But uh, if there is a, an outbreak, and they said, you know, we don't get too concerned if one person in the school gets sick. Uh, they're told to go home and quarantine. Unlike a few weeks ago, when one person from a school got sick, they just had that person quarantined. The rest of their family was able to kind of come and go as they pleased. Now, if a family member gets sick and, and is asked to, to stay home from school, uh, if they have brothers or sisters, uh, those kids won't be able to go to school either. But their goal is to keep the health system functioning properly, keep schools open, and as best as possible, keep workplaces open. But um, I think given all that, we're going to revert to more or less being close to the public at the municipal facilities. We'll be getting this information out. Uh, Barb was on the call as well. I'm sure she's working. Uh, we'll get information out to Front Porch Forum. Uh, Secretary Smith promised that they would try to get a template that uh, provides consistent in, uh, information out to all municipalities so that uh, we can all push that same information out together. So anyway. Um, Bill? Yeah. Just a clarification, we have been close to the public all along. Yeah, except we're open by appointment and I'm not sure. To, to, the, to, the, to the public, not to professionals, right? Title searchers and lawyers are coming by appointment. Right, but the public has been coming by appointment too of late, I think. There's been people coming into the zoning offices. There's been, there's been people in the building. Yeah. And I think we're gonna revert for the time being back to the way it was in, uh, in April and May is what I'm saying. So are you saying we won't be- They're asking us to do this for a couple of weeks. You know, hopefully this doesn't have to extend for months and months, but, uh, you know, probably between now and in the middle of December. Are you saying we won't be taking any appointments? I, I don't know yet, Carolyn. Okay. I just want to understand. And I'm not sure everyone saw, but I, I saw, I did check and it's on a municipal site, but the COVID pop-up that's now in town, um, right. for Waterbury Ambulance is set up. Yep. The, uh, the, Dr. Levine indicated that they are working now to uh, get 14 permanent, new, new permanent testing sites up. The Waterbury site is one of them. Uh, the Waterbury site is not an on-demand site. You do need an appointment to go there. Uh, but um, it, they're trying to make testing uh, much more accessible throughout the, the, the state and these two counties in particular right now. So, you know, I'll keep you posted as best as possible, but I think that for the foreseeable future, we're gonna to have to continue to meet by Zoom when we meet. I was hoping that maybe by 
this time we would be back uh, meeting together, but that's not going to be the case for another couple weeks anyway. Katie? Um, I don't know if you have the answer to this or even an inkling. I know um, neighboring towns and their highway departments, if things go keep going negatively, um, they're looking at rearranging highway department schedules um, and possibly like cutting back on help. Is this something that you've been thinking of if it's a possibility because with the winter we can't really cut back, you know, 20 hours, say if there's a major snowstorm or something like that. So just wondering if that's on your radar. Yeah, I nothing definitive yet, Katie. I did talk to Bill Woodruff, the public works director on Friday just to start thinking about what we might have to do. Uh, for the time being, we're leaving things as they are in the public works departments. Um, we'll be encouraging them to spend as little time together as possible. You know, we're, we're moving pretty much past the time of year where there's lots of uh, activities where, you know, they're building something or working on maintaining a project where they have to be working shoulder to shoulder. Um, and certainly, you know, in snowstorms, they'll be pretty isolated. They're all in their own vehicles. But yeah, we're, we're thinking about it, but I don't have any uh, definite directive right now to share. All right, any other questions or on this topic or we'll move to, um, can someone remind me what the addition was? I didn't write it down. Mike, I think you had added. Yeah, it, just out of curiosity, because we're now starting receipt to uh, receive, receive the Waterbury Reader. I almost said record, but that's in the past. Uh, as our local, yeah, she, she has she has the paper in front of us. I'm looking at that being, you know, that's going to be the most read source of information in town, other than, you know. You know, the Valley paper is is a good paper. They've been doing a yeoman's job. The Times Argus really doesn't cover that heavily Waterbury, uh, but I think, Bill, they're, they're our paper of record, technically, right? Yeah, the Times Argus is our paper of record right now. Um, Lisa is on the call. Yeah. Um, Lisa, do you have the capability of, of um, printing legal notices as and uh, and the like, you know, printing agendas, uh, in particular, you know, DRB or planning commission type stuff, public notices. I, I I'm psyched to hear that everybody is has seen this. And Katie, thanks for having one handy. <laughs> um, it was our first one, and this is a project with the Times Argus, so. They, their advertising department can probably talk with you about how they would want to do that. I don't know if they would switch the contract to be um, ads just landing in the reader and not the Times Argus. I think that you would probably still want to have the ability to put ads in a daily paper because this is just a weekly. Sometimes there's, there's, a, there's occasions that come up that you need to have the flexibility to put something in sooner rather than later, right? Um, yeah, so we, we've always, when the Waterbury record was in place. Um, that was our paper of record, but the Times Argus was the alternate. Mm -hmm. Publish all of our legal notices in the Waterbury record, but on occasion there were times that because of certain deadlines and how long before a meeting something had to be published, if, if that was the case, we would put it in the Times Argus. So, right. I guess the question is, and I, I can reach out to the people at the Times, I guess, um, you know, can we have things published in the reader if we do that? Is that at a, is that at a lower rate or, a, you know, um, the Times, I guess, and, and, you know, I subscribe to the Times, I guess, and think it's a really good paper. They have a lot of local coverage, um, but compared to the Watery Record, it was, it's very expensive for, for these legal notices. Right now, it's our only, only alternative. So we can read to them. Um, and uh, I don't think you should change the paper of record at this point. If we can get it in the reader, we will. Uh, but uh, I think the Times Argus is the best 
for right now, until we get some further information, not changing that is probably a good idea. Sure, well, it, was, it was more to bring up an, a, a discussion on, you know, to look at the future, because I think more people would get value by seeing it in the reader because it's gonna come into everyone's mailbox. I did shoot an email over at the beginning of the meeting when that item came up. I, I sent a message over to the publisher who I've been working with today on deadline stuff. And he sent me the name of the person that um, you should probably talk with on the advertising end who could probably, um, you could discuss this with if you wanted to know what prices would be or how that would work. Um, this is all a new thing for them too, so. Can you just email that to me, Lisa? Yep, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Yep, thanks everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Um, unless there's anything else for this evening, I will take a motion to adjourn. One last thing. Yep. Um, Carla, you want to chime in about uh, orders? We really need orders to get signed. Last week, I think they weren't signed at all. So. It has been the case, but they came back in record speed today. Oh, good. Great. I was, yeah, I was quick on the draw bill today. Mike? Yeah, Mike. Well, right, well, if, uh, we, we don't Mike, why don't you take responsibility and try to be the one that does it? Yeah, we don't like waiting until Thursday or Friday to get checks out for our vendors and taxpayers. My problem is, is when I'm at camp or something like that, I don't have access to any scanners or anything like that. Okay. Can you remind me, can that, can that be digitally signed? Because I think that's a big problem for yeah. me. Okay. It, it can be on your iPhone. You can um, sign it on your iPhone and send it back. I try to do it if I see it on my lunch break. <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank you. All right, I'll take a motion. Ooh. Motion to adjourn. Give it to Katie. Now, would you like to second? I would like to second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Have a good night, everybody. Thank you all. Have a good night, everybody. Thanksgiving. You too.